So I was asked to say yes, but I have to acknowledge that I come from Italy where I have good teachers and politicians, so it's clear that my position will be at the end very difficult to interpret. So. Okay, so of course if we ask ourselves about the possible impact of treating all patients with malofibrosis with a ruxolitinib is because we, uh, in terms of survival, because we know that survival is uh, the, the key uh, factor for the management of patients with malofibrosis and this is clearly supported by the clinical scores that have been developed over the last years that distinguish four different risk groups of patients from low to high risk. And as you can see, uh, these data are very well known, that there is a huge difference between being a low risk or an intermediate to a high risk patient with malofibrosis with the survival that is, yes, still reduces compared to the control population, but in excess of 10, 15 years in the low risk while it's about two years in the high risk and it's about four years in the intermediate to risk. At the same time, we are also quite uh, satisfied about the fact to see that our management of patients over the last year has improved. Francisco Cervantes working on the series of the IPSS score has been able to show that there has been some improvement in the management of the patients in the last decades, and this was especially in patients in the lower risk categories, while there was no significant improvement in patients in the higher risk category. So this means that we probably have improved our uh, capacity to support better these patients, but of course the curve still tell us that these patients continue to die. Of course, the situation is more dramatic in the higher risk category. So what are the data available in the literature on which we should discuss? The data comes from the uh, two phase three randomized trial that are the COMFORT-1 and COMFORT-2 studies. These trials enrolled patients with malofibrosis, both primary and post-PV, post-T malofibrosis, to receive ruxolitinib against placebo in the COMFORT-1 or against best available therapy in the COMFORT-2. Then patients could cross over from the control arm to the active arm according to uh, specified rules in the protocol in both, in both trials. But these trials enrolled patients who were intermediate to and high risk category according to the IPSS. So all the data that we have right now are related to these two categories of patients. There was no low risk, lower risk uh, patient included in these trials. And the results of this trial have been presented in several uh, communications and they are fully published. These are the uh, three-year update of COMFORT-1, and as you can see here, there is clearly an advantage of patients who were originally randomized to ruxolitinib. This is an intention to treat curve, as compared to patients who were originally randomized to placebo. And you should, of course, consider that at a certain time point, these patients were almost all crossover to the ruxolitinib arm. And these curves indicate that there is a survival advantage with the Nazar ratio of 0 0.69, even if this is close to the significance level because the number uh, in the last part of the number of patients in the last part of the curves are really few. However, these data are supported further by the results of the 3.5 update of COMFORT 2 trial, where again it comes. Uh, clear that there is a survival advantage for patients who were originally randomized to ruxolitinib. This is again an intention to treat analysis. The proportion of deaths were 27% in the ruxo against 41% in the BAT arm. And overall there was a reduction of about 42% in the risk of dying in the comfort to study in patients receiving ruxolitinib as compared to BAT. And of course, the hazard ratio was 0 0.58, and this was statistically significant. However, the interpretation of this data is quite complicated by the fact that these trials included the crossover. 
And this was, of course, due for ethical reasons. It was not possible to design a trial at this time point where patients included in control arms were not allowed to cross over in case the uh, active uh, drug was shown to be better than the uh, control arm. And of course, this makes complicated the analysis. And this is also at the basis of a large debate that there is in the literature with some investigators who uh, are not totally convinced uh, about this data. So trying to, uh, uh, to add further information in this regard, this is a complicated statistical analysis method that is called rank preserving structural failure time that is an analysis that is, has been used and validated in clinical trials, even in patients with solid tumors, that include a crossover arm. According to this analysis, patients who are in the control arm are considered to remain in the control arm until they are effectively in the control arm, and then they are projected to cross over to the active arm. And so if you look at this data, it comes clear that by uh, correcting the control arm for the crossover, then the impact of the, uh, the positive impact of ruxolitinib on survival is even more evident. So by making this pool analysis of the two comfort trials that uh, is made possible by the fact that the characteristics of the patients in the two comfort trials, the enrollment criteria, criteria were exactly the same, then according to the intention to treat analysis, this pooled survival analysis showed anyway an improvement in survival with an hazard ratio of 0.65. But if you use this kind of analysis correcting from crossover, over, then the hazard ratio is even more in favor of ruxolitinib, it's 0.29. And uh, Francesco Passamonti, working on the DIPSS series, made this study that is clearly a retrospective study, but where the patients enrolled in the comfort to trial were compared with a large database, large control database that was used for the development of the DIPSS score. And so this is an, a comparative analysis of patients who, moving from the DIPSS database, could have been enrolled in the comfort to trial because of disease characteristics and clinical characteristics. And again, this data support the fact that the risk of dying is reduced by 40, about 40% by comparing patients treated in comfort to with the DIPS, uh, the DIPS series. So one point that we have also to consider, and this moves us towards the category of the lower risk patients is that we have clear evidence that we, we know from our experience that malofibrosis is not a static disorder, but it's a continuing disorder. And so patients move from the lower to the high risk categories. This is why the dynamic IPSS score also has been devised. And in this work, it, in this paper that is being presented at ASH, it's not yet fully published. However, it was calculated that patients in each category spend a defined lapse of time before progressing to the next risk category. Patients in the low risk category remain in this low risk for about five years, but then they progress to the high risk category, and the same is for intermediate one about two years and intermediate to about one seven years. So we can expect that over relatively short time, even patients in the lower risk category can move to higher risk category. And this, uh, these two curves tell us a quite important information that in the comfort trials, those patients who were in the high risk categories had a survival advantage that made them quite similar to the intermediate to risk category. So there is clear an improvement and there seems to be, let's say, like a downgrading of these patients from a higher to a lower risk category. So going next to the question of this debate, moving from this data, and if we consider that progression to a high risk category is intrinsic to the disease and eventually the large majority of patients will progress, and that there is evidence that by 
treating patients, even in the high-risk category, with ruxolitinib, you can improve their projected risk downgrading to a lower risk category, then we can hypothesize that one effect of ruxolitinib employed in lower risk category may be that of reducing the progression to a higher risk category. And of course, this will translate an improvement to survival because progressing to higher risk category means reduce expected survival. This is clearly an important point. This is debated. And in a, a consensus position paper that was made by Italian uh, hematologists, it was clearly stressed that this is an important point for research that at the present time we lack based evidence for the opportunity uh, to, to use ruxolitinib in all patients because of the design of the comfort trials in the high risk category. But this is clearly, this point is clearly uh, requiring attention because we have evidence from these trials that the drug may have a disease modifying activity and impact on survival. So the, the question is nowadays uh, how we can uh, think about showing an impact of ruxolitinib in earlier phases of disease. So it's clear, this is the same table as the first one, that we cannot use uh, the hardened point of survival as an endpoint of a clinical trial, because here we are speaking of more than 10 years of survival. But we can uh, take advantage of some information that we have acquired in the last couple of years. Uh, the next three slides have been presented more than one time this morning, so I will be very fast. But we now have information that we can stratify patients according to their risk in a IPSS independent way based on the main three mutations, JAK2, KR, and of course MNPL, and of course the fact of being triple negative. We know that there are four mutations that identify high molecular risk of patients, and this is quite important. By using these mutations, we are now able to substratify the patients in the lower risk categories according to the IPSS based on their molecular risk. And so it comes out that about 20% of those patients who are considered as being low risk are actually high molecular risk. And this is a group of patients where we could figure since now the, uh, the opportunity and may maybe we can also predict a positive impact of ruxolitinib. And to further support the possibility to use the drug even in this group of patients waiting for some positive results is the demonstration that these mutations do not impact on the clinical efficacy of the drug and they do not seem to have any negative impact on in the terms of, of survival. So, I would like to end with this that is again a statement from a group of people thinking. This is a group from the European Leukemia Net and the International Working Group for MPN Research and Treatment. And here it's clearly posed this key question, how can we demonstrate the impact of these new drugs in preventing disease progression in patients with early disease? And so it's clear that we need clinical trials to show this, and it's very likely that we can use carefully stratified, stratified population of patients and that we can use, uh, let's say, clinical surrogate markers of benefits that are represented by progression-free survival or event-free survival. I think that this is the route to give at the end of the story, an answer about the question whether all patients, including the lower risk patients with myelofibrosis, fibrosis, should be treated with ruxolitinib based on the data that we have in the high risk category. At first, I would like to thank for the invitation to this debate. I was happy to be able to be here. But when I saw uh, my topic, I was not so happy anymore um, because I have to say no. Probably uh, you are in the meantime very convinced that there is no no. But you will see. 
First, I'm also convinced that there is a yes, there is obviously an advantage of the survival in comparison to a placebo, but also in comparison to best available therapy. I don't have such nice curves on such a long time, but um, certainly there is an advantage. But I have to go back to the title. When I um, realized what can I do in my situation, uh, the organizers brought me. I um, can tell you the title says Check 2 therapy, Check 2 inhibitor therapy for all patients. Okay, so I would say it's not good for all patients. There is some evidence that uh, there is some resistance against uh, ruxolitinib or CHEC2 inhibitors in general because uh, of a heterodimerization of a uh, CHEC2 receptor after um, of, uh, in, of the erythropoietin receptor after a longer time of CHEC2 inhibitor therapy. This has been uh, shown um, in um, the mouse model, but it can also be observed in patients. Uh, there is no other resistance mechanism known so far, but uh, from the clinical point of view, we have the impression that some patients are resistant against uh, ruxolitinib or against CHEC2 inhibitors. And um, we are in line with this observation with something what has been published by the Mayo Group. They say a small but not insignificant proportion, not quantified in the papers, had worse symptoms uh, at week 24. Um, and um, you can see in this uh, uh, waterfall plot that indeed not just uh, in the placebo group, also in the uh, ruxolitinib group there is um, a proportion of patient who is resistant or intolerant uh, for ruxolitinib. There is also a certain proportion of patients who have a shrinkage of the spleen size, which is not so much, which is uh, about 10% uh, or even less. And the same is true with a Comfort 2 study, where is the same proportion of patients who did not respond to ruxolitinib or who did have a very marginal uh, decrease of the spleen size during the therapy with ruxolitinib. Um, and I would also like to show the prognostic score, but I will interpret it in my way. Um, this is uh, the TIPS or the IPSS, in, um, dependent when uh, you apply it. And we did apply this uh, prognostic scores for some of our patients where we had the impression ruxolitinib was not so successful. At first, a male patient, 61 years old, diagnosed with primary myelofibrosis, CHEC2 negative, and uh, the CHEC2 inhibitor therapy was started in July 2012. Um, at this time, after this evaluation, at the beginning of the CHEC2 inhibitor therapy, the patient was a high-risk patient, had already beyond 7% myeloplasts in the peripheral blood, uh, did have anemia, uh, and did have also an elevated uh, LDH level. After um, two years of treatment, he dropped dramatically with uh, the hemoglobin level, the leukocyte count went up, and he did already fulfill the diagnostic criteria of acute leukemia, and um, he died three years after start of the therapy with ruxolitinib. The second patient from our cohort, again, a male patient, 50 year, 55 years old at the time of diagnosis, it was 2011, 
He had a post-PV myelofibrosis. He was hydroxyurea resistant, certainly CHEK2 positive. And we started the CHEK2 inhibitor therapy in October 2013. Um, at this time, he had a normal uh, hemoglobin level, but uh, very much elevated white blood cell counts, despite hydroxyurea was low with his platelet counts. Um, had an enlarged spleen and had already um, more than five percent myeloblasts in the peripheral blood, uh, blood um, before the start of the CHEK2 inhibitor. It was lowered uh, by hydroxyurea and he qualified also as high risk patient. He died four years after diagnosis and two years after ruxolitinib therapy. So another not very successful patient. And the third patient, uh, again, um, a male patient, 59 years old, at the time of diagnosis, 2010. He was diagnosed with primary myelofibrosis, was uh, in a um, uh, clinical trial using bomalitomide, check 2 positive, and then we started uh, in uh, February 2014 um, with uh, ruxolitinib. It was very late in his uh, disease. At this time, he was already very uh, severe transfusion dependent, had elevated white blood cell counts, and had already elevated blasts at the time of the inclusion in the ruxolitinib trial uh, treatment. He had um, uh, more than 10% blasts, certainly qualified uh, as high-risk patient, and died two months after start uh, with uh, ferruxolitinib therapy. So what is my impression in uh, some uh, special patients? There is no benefit of a CHEK2 inhibitor therapy in a very late stage of myelofibrosis. And uh, we have from the clinical uh, practice the impression uh, as long as we see that uh, the CHEK2 inhibitor therapy is not very successful, might even worsen uh, the anemia and increase the transfusion dependency. It's not so easy to withdraw the CHEK2 inhibitor in these patients because the tolerance is extremely poor and might uh, uh, transform this patient in a very, very uh, uh, intensive disease with a uh, intensive uh, cytokine storm. So in such a setting, we see um, very frequently such uh, ruxolitinib withdrawal syn syndrome. And um, the answer is uh, ruxolitinib is not good for all patients because many patients are in a very late stage. It's not good for all patients because there is a subset of patients maybe with a primary resistance against the compound. And finally, there is certainly a contraindication uh, or let's say a relative contraindication for ruxolitinib therapy in such situations where uh, the platelet count is uh, below uh, 50,000. So I would say uh, ruxolitinib is an excellent compound, uh, but not for all patients. And I would also say uh, that we should be cautious with this compound uh, when we see um, that uh, the myelofibrosis approaches the end stage of the disease. Thank you.